Well, hi, hey, neighbor. Welcome to the final session, session number six, lesson number six of season number three of Grab Bag. And since this is the final grab bag in this six week series, uh, rather than introduce a different discussion, I figured that we would just continue on through the ending of chapter 11 and into the beginning of chapter 12 of the Gospel of John. We have come through from the very beginning of chapter 11 to the resurrection of Lazarus. And it might seem like, okay, anything after that's anticlimactic, but it's very important for us to see what developed after the resurrection of Lazarus. So lesson five ended with the resurrection of Lazarus when Jesus spoke with, uh, as I said, a voice that would raise the dead and said, Lazarus, come out. And the gospel actually says that he almost shouted. He spoke at the top of his voice. And it was a voice that reached into heaven and called Lazarus from paradise back to Bethany. So, you know, when, you, when we think about that, how do you think Lazarus felt? I, you know, he's up in heaven and did he hear the voice or did somebody come and say, hey, Lazarus, Jesus is calling for you. And, you know, as, as much as we would love to be able to have back our loved ones who have gone before us, I think from the perspective of our loved ones, coming back here would be like a digression. It would be a step backwards. Because our goal, obviously, is to escape this place, to, to step through door into the door of death into eternity and to experience more than we've ever been able to comprehend or see or, or know. And so, you know, Lazarus is in heaven and, or might say in paradise, as Jesus told the thief on the cross, the day you'll be with me in paradise, Lazarus is there. And boy, when the Lord of life calls, you got to go. And so Lazarus is resurrected from the dead. Now we know that every action results in consequences or reactions. And that's true whether you're the son of God or not. When a resurrection happens, I mean, you would naturally experience or expect that there would be consequences. <laughs> to, to expect less after an event like that, you know, after a man four days dead walks out alive would be like having a 7.0 earthquake and then expecting, oops. okay, that was re my reminder to pray the Lord send workers into the harvest field. So, Lord, I'm praying that, that you'll, man, that you'll just send workers, that people will feel moved in their hearts to, to go and to take the gospel to, to places next door, as well as to places across the sea. And I pray for power and effectiveness of the gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. So, pardon the interruption, as they say. Where were we? You know, it, to expect that Lazarus would resurrect from the dead and that there would be no reactions or consequences is like, like I said, having a, having a 7.0 earthquake and then somehow thinking that not one building would be left undamaged and that not one lake would have a single ripple. There's going to be some aftershock, so to speak, from an event like this. And so verse 44 tells us that after Lazarus emerged from the tomb, you know, wrapping or walking around like a wrapped adult burrito, uh, Jesus gave instructions for Lazarus to be set free. He said, set him free. I wonder who would have been the first and brave enough to walk up to Lazarus and begin the removal of the burial wrappings. I mean, would that have been you? I think I would have been a little bit hesitant because who knows what's under there? <laughs> this is an unprecedented event. Like people talk about the, you know, the pandemic. This is an unprecedented event. Well, this was an unprecedented event. 
And Jesus says, set him free. Well, okay. Who's going to be the first one to go up there and start taking those wrappings off of this uh, resurrected body? But, you know, this resurrection of Lazarus, I think, is also a good metaphor for we who come to Christ, that we are dead in our sin. And we're wrapped up in the things of life that restrict us and that want to keep us dead. But Jesus, through grace, says, set them free. And we experience a freedom like we've never known before. Verse 45, then, after Jesus says to loosen Lazarus from his grave clothes, verse 45 begins with the word, therefore indicating that what John is about to write is a direct consequence of the miracle of Lazarus's resurrection. And here's that consequence. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. All right, all right, all right. As Matthew McConaughey would say, that's an outcome that we would have hoped for. Jews who had come to visit Mary and up to mourn with Mary, who had followed Mary to Jesus and followed them to the uh, graveyard, many of them, John says, believed in him. <laughs> many, not just a few, but many Jews who had left home to attend a funeral ironically became witnesses to a tomb emptying funeral ending miracle. And as a result, the NIV says they believed in him. But the Greek word again is a form of the Greek word pistis, which is translated faith. These people faithed, if we can say it that way, they faithed in Jesus. They pledged their trust and obedience to Jesus, who was the resurrection and the life. So instead of traveling to a funeral and bringing home a tunic with a beautiful Bethany logo printed on the front or carrying back home a killer COVID virus, they brought home something more valuable and eternal. They brought home faith in Christ, a wonderful contagion, an excellent consequence of Lazarus's resurrection. But as you might guess, it wasn't all rejoicing in roses in verse 46, we read, but some of them went to the Pharisees and they tattletailed. They told them what Jesus had done. And then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin, which was a ruling body of the Jewish nation, the religious political movers and shakers. And they got together and this was John's synopsis of their conversation. What are we accomplishing? They asked. Here's this man performing many signs, not just a few, but many. I mean, they probably had a list somewhere of all the miracles that Jesus did. And John at the end of his gospels says that if I was to list everything that Jesus did, there wouldn't be libraries enough to contain the books. So they knew <laughs> this hadn't escaped. This wasn't going on unnoticed under their political noses, you know. So they said, this man's performing many signs, and if we, if we let him go on like this, everyone will, <laughs> I love that, everyone, you know, like when your kids, everybody else is doing it, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Now, it's nice that they're concerned about their country, you know, They'll take away our temple and our nation. So they're concerned about their nation and their religion. Yeah. And maybe there's a grain of truth in that. But if you read between the lines, what they are saying is they'll take away our source of power and our prestige and our affluence and our personal um, our personal. Um, affluence, that's what I'm getting at, my personal affluence, and they'll take away our influence. You see, these guys, these guys are up against the ropes, and they're desperate because this upstart Rocky character by the name of Jesus just won't lie down and quit. He won't stop. 
They've got to do something about that. And they will. So they think. But John inserts an interesting insight in verses 49 through 52. And it just seems like in the narrative, like it's kind of out of place, but John feels it's very important. See, if God can use a donkey to speak to a false prophet, as he did with Balaam in the Old Testament, then he can use an unjust hypocritical politician to prophesy on his behalf. And that is what he does when Caiaphas addresses the Sanhedrin. In, in, in a little bit, a little bit, in a few months or a couple months, Caiaphas will preside at Jesus' mockery of a Jewish trial. But John relates how the high priest right here sticks his priestly slipper in his unholy mouth and predicts that Jesus will one day die for God's people. God uses Caiaphas to give a word of testimony about his plan and his purpose before the Sanhedrin. It's kind of cool that John makes sure that we know that. In verse 53, from that time on, they plotted to take Jesus' life. They're, they're out to get Jesus. He's just, um, you know, messing up the establishment. There's this rebel of a guy. This was the bad consequence of Lazarus's resurrection. The power boys had their target. They're the crossbow, but they need an arrow to shoot for the kill. And that arrow, as we know, is Judas. In verse 54, therefore Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea, Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. Now, Jesus isn't a dummy. Jesus knows what's happening. So he withdraws. Now, is he afraid? Is he a scaredy cat? N not one bit. In the 27th verse of the next chapter, John chapter 12, we read a most telling description of Jesus' attitude. John writes Jesus as saying, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? Get me out of this? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. So, Father, glorify your name. Jesus isn't unaware of what's happening. Jesus isn't afraid. Earlier, Jesus had retreated to a place in the desert before he went to Bethany. If you remember, he had retreated. And then he came front and center for the resurrection of Lazarus, knowing full well the consequences that would come. And he will come front and center again. But he's not afraid. He is on God's timetable and not his enemy's timetable. They're going to do something to Jesus and about what they perceive as rebellion and unrest and stirring up trouble, but they're not going to do it on their timetable. They're going to do it when God has it planned. It was planned in heaven that Jesus would die on the Passover, not one day sooner, not one day later. And so now, is a time for Jesus and the disciples to retreat and to wait. And so he retreats to a town near the desert named Ephraim. Now, meanwhile, back at the ranch, as we say, meanwhile, the assassination atmosphere is heating up in Jerusalem. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem. And they kept looking, verse 56, for Jesus. In verse 57, the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they could arrest Jesus. I, I don't want to assume that everyone is familiar with the origins of the Passover. You know, there, there may be some of you who are just good Bible students, and you know, but not everybody who's watching this may be familiar with the Passover. So I'm going to give a 
quick synopsis of this annual high and holy day of Jewish religion. If you're already up on the Passover and you're a professional, hey, go ahead and take a minute to get something to drink. It won't be very long, but so here we go. Israel had been captive. They were captive slaves in Egypt. And God sent Moses, who told Pharaoh to release the nation of Israel from Egyptian captivity, that God was going to lead the nation to a new land promised centuries earlier by God in a promise to their patriarch, Abraham. Pharaoh refused to participate. So God moved him to seeing things God's way through a series of 10 plagues. The final plague involved an angel of death sweeping over the land and causing the death of the firstborn son in every household. Now the Jews were instructed ahead of time to put the blood of an unblemished lamb on their doorposts. And if they did, the angel of death would pass over and leave those households untouched. After that, annually, the Jews remembered the Passover with a massive feast that was attended by Jewish family members from around and outside the country. Okay, so the Passover name just gets its name from the angel of death passing over the households of the Jews in Egypt that had the blood of a lamb on their doorposts. And you can, you can see the kind of, we don't want to get distracted here, but the confluence of Jesus, our Passover lamb, is what the Bible says. Jesus' blood being shed on the cross as the lamb of God on Passover. I mean, you can see that, that lesson and that meaning coming together, I hope. You know, John the Baptist, when his disciples and he were in sight of Jesus, the Bible says that John pointed to Jesus and said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So the Passover Lamb spared physical death in Egypt. The Passover Lamb of Jesus spares eternal death for those of us who come under the blood of Christ and who faith in God. Okay, that's my quick explanation. So John then, as we would go back to the gospel narrative, tells us that many went up from the country to Jerusalem for the Passover. That was an annual thing. But the people on the, they were aware of the political intrigue that was going on in Jerusalem. They were on high alert. They had been warned to tell the Pharisees of any Jesus sighting because his enemies were on the hunt. So now we're going to move to chapter 12. According to chapter 12, six days before the Passover, one week before Jesus' trial, death, and resurrection, Jesus left Ephraim and returned to Bethany. Now, Mark 14 tells us that Jesus was invited to a party at the home of Simon the leper. How would you like to be known Simon the leper? I mean, he didn't have leprosy. He met Jesus and Jesus healed him of leprosy. But yet that, I mean, John writes it down. That must be the way that people thought of him. Now, I would have wanted to say, hey, call me Simon the healed leper, if anything. But anyway. The party was in Bethany, and even though the party was at Simon's house, I mean, they were probably the Lazarus family and Simon, they're probably friends in this village of Bethany. And so the party is being held at Simon's house. Maybe, maybe Lazarus's house was having some construction done, or maybe Simon had a bigger house and a bigger room. I mean, you're getting Jesus and Lazarus in the same location. I mean, Lazarus himself is a popular figure and is drawing large crowds, the Bible says, and now Jesus is coming. So maybe they chose a larger venue. I don't know. Hey, maybe, maybe Martha, maybe Martha and Simon were an item, you know, maybe they were dating or, or whatever. I, I don't know. For some reason, the party is being held at Simon's house, but even though it's being held at Simon's house, 
Martha is still the hostess with the mostess. And she's there hosting the whole thing. Simon is hosting, well, I'm, okay. You understand, she's, she's hosting, Simon is the host, but she is also hosting. So Martha is serving and Lazarus is attending and like most men, probably Lazarus is eating. At some point in the party, anyway, Mary walks into the room with a singular purpose. Verse three of chapter 12, Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, I want to add a correction here, because last week I said that she took a pound of pure nard, and you probably don't remember that. Maybe nobody caught that, but I did, and so I want to apologize, and I want to correct um, right here. She has a pint of pure nard, and she pours it on Jesus and wipes his feet with her hair. Mary was the one sister of Lazarus who sat at Jesus's feet listening to, or, or perhaps as we say, she would be hanging on to every word that he taught. On a previous occasion, you may recall, if you're a Bible student, Despite cultural protocols about women in a room with men, despite cultural protocols against women learning, think Yentl, if you saw that movie years ago with Barbara Streisand, and despite familial kitchen calls from Martha insisting that Mary help her, Mary stayed at Jesus' feet to learn from the master teacher. Now, when Martha complained to Jesus about Mary's failure to help, Jesus had, as we say, he had Mary's six and told the upset Martha that Mary had made the wisest, the best choice by choosing substance over style, by choosing the word of God to feed her soul over things in the kitchen that would feed people physically. This incident, I think, gives insight into how Jesus valued discipleship even over gender discrimination. Folks, Jesus never diminished a woman's value. Once again, here in this incident, this, at Simon the leper's house, Mary breaks protocol by entering the hall and room, <coughs> excuse me, of a neighbor. I know water sitting over there, but it's all, we've got a cap on it. <clears throat> I'm going to take the time. Where she pours an alabaster jar full of pure nard on the feet of Jesus and wipes them with her hair. Now often nard was held in reserve as part of a wedding dowry, excuse me. Nard was held in reserve as part of a wedding dowry, but Mary found a higher purpose and a higher person for its use. Jesus explains the purpose in verses 7 and 8. He says, it was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Now, when people read that, they think, wait a second, Jesus isn't being buried. What, you know, what's, is this out of context? But if you read the same incident in the Gospel of Mark, th there's a more defining there. In verse 8 of chapter 14, Mark records, she, that's Mary, did what she could. She poured perfume, I'm sorry, this is Jesus speaking. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. So when John writes that um, this was perfume that was for the day of my burial, Day is kind of like a, a broader term, you know, the time or the day of my burial, not a specific day. So she did this beforehand to prepare for my burial. In one week after Jesus' death, the disciples, the people in the room would comprehend the significance of Mary's actions and the truth of Jesus' words. Because in one week, Jesus will be buried. So 
what we have here is an account of a true worshiper of Jesus. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and John combined inform us that Mary anointed Jesus' head and his feet. John tells us that she anointed his feet, but the other Gospels include his head. She anointed his head and his feet. She anointed his head, I think, to acknowledge his authority. And she anointed his feet, I think, to acknowledge her servitude. Taking care of the feet of guests was the role of a servant. Wiping them with her hair, which women valued as their personal crown and rarely ever let down in public, demonstrated that she was the Lord's servant. Her expensive perfume, the use of a dowry item worth more than the Gospels tell us, more than a year's wages. I mean, this was expensive perfume. This was a year's worth of wages. I mean, I don't know what, you know, if you make $60,000, this is $60,000 right there. Her willingness to bow and wipe Jesus's feet with her hair all indicated her submission to Jesus as Lord in Christ. This was a lady who was worshiping the Son of God with all abandon. As many lessons as Jesus gave about his coming crucifixion, it seems that Mary was the one student who perhaps more than any other person or any of the disciples understood all that Jesus had been teaching about himself and his death. She had put the pieces together. She connected the dots, you know, she hooked up the Lego. She, she got it all together. She knew that Jesus had come to die. And she comes to honor and serve him with her costly gift. In verses three to six, we learn, however, that the fragrance of this expensive perfume was a stench in the nostrils of one Judas Iscariot who complained that its use on Jesus' feet was a waste. John says Judas was a thief who regularly stole from the disciples' money resources. So he was using this feigned righteous condemnation of Mary's extravagance for a smokescreen for his greed and selfishness. I mean, you know, this is a year's worth of year's wages. Can you imagine a greedy guy like Judas thinking, I could use that. I could steal that money. Nard, as I had mentioned in the lesson early, previous lesson, was a highly prized ointment from northern India. And so, yeah, this is worth a year's wages. And Lazarus does not like the fact that it's being poured out on the feet of Jesus. It seems that no good gift goes unpunished, as they say, and the Gospel of Mark records some of those present were saying indignantly, indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked Mary harshly. Well, when Judas and the others began to grumble and complain and attempt to diminish and embarrass Mary, once again, Jesus has her back. He comes up to her, he comes for her defense and upholds Mary's value as a child of God. And I think in doing that, Jesus also teaches a lesson for everyone about the value of all women. So Jesus is saying women are not less than men in the eyes of their creator. Paul will later write, in Christ there is no rich or poor, no male nor female, nor slave nor free. He's not saying there's no gender differences. What he is saying is that when it comes to Jesus, rich, poor, male, female, slavery, we're all standing on level common ground as sinners. We are all in need of a savior. And this account shows us that, that Jesus values anyone who will serve him 
and love him. This account also provides a fragrant note on which to close this lesson. I didn't like that segue. <laughs> Jesus as a defender. That's a good lesson for us to embrace as we close. As with Mary, Jesus is our defender. The Bible calls him our advocate. In Job 16 verses 9 through 21, we read, Job is saying, even now, my witness is in heaven. My advocate is on high. My intercessor is my friend. As my eyes pour out tears to God on behalf of a man, he pleads with God as one pleads for a friend. What a beautiful description of Jesus. My intercessor is my friend. And as my eyes pour out tears to God on behalf of a man, he pleads with God as one pleads for a friend. That is such comforting truth for us. In Hebrews chapter 7, the Hebrew writer, verse 24 and 25, writes, But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Can there be a more assuring verse in the Bible? Now, there can be verses that are equally assuring, but none more assuring than that verse. The Hebrew writer doesn't say that he lives to intercede for them. He says he always lives to intercede for them. That's his business. He always lives to intercede for them. Let Satan condemn in the aftermath of our sin. We have one who stands in defense for us, one who always lives to intercede for us. And good news, my friends, that intercessor's father is Almighty God. And he's our father because of Jesus. And I hope that calms your soul as it does mine. I hope it gives you assurance as it does me. Because I'm a sinner. And I would be lost without Jesus. And Satan does a real job on my mind and my heart with inward condemnation as I look at and compare the sinner that I am to the holiness of God. And Jesus gets in the middle and says, I'll stand in the gap for you. I'll intercede for you. When you're crying out your tears before God, I'm speaking to him on behalf of a friend. I am your intercessor. Bottom line, those three words that are so often overused, but it's truth. Jesus is saying, I love you. I hope that peace fills your heart and mind as you remember that truth. Thanks for taking the time to be part of these lessons. I hope that they've given you some biblical information, but I hope they've given you some heart information that comforts you, strengthens you, grew your faith. And uh, I just am so grateful for this opportunity. And once again, thank you very much.